Welcome everyone. In this video I wanted to talk through some practice problems related to evaluating aromaticity and anti-aromaticity as well as substituent effects on acidity and these problems have relevance to learning target two in organic chemistry two in the spring 2024 semester. Okay so the first thing I wanted to bring up was evaluating aromaticity and anti-aromaticity and a couple of quirks related to heteroatoms and tetrahedral carbons that I observed when grading the quiz. So first of all, tetrahedral atoms in a ring are going to essentially ruin aromaticity. So for example, in the structure on the left, we've got two tetrahedral carbons in the structure, and, and even one is sufficient to sort of ruin aromaticity. So even if we had, say, a carbanion right here so that we have six pi electrons that looks like an aromatic number of pi electrons the the problem here quote unquote and the key thing to notice is this tetrahedral carbon right here which is going to make this molecule non aromatic as an aside if there were any substituents on the ring this wouldn't change anything one way or another when we evaluate aromaticity or anti-aromaticity we're looking for the cyclic portion of the molecule and focusing on that cyclic portion of the molecule to decide whether the cycle or in some cases the the polycycle right if there are multiple rings fused to each other are aromatic or anti-aromatic or non-aromatic when heteroatoms come into play we've got to consider lone pairs pretty carefully in this structure, for example, we should notice that there's one lone pair on the oxygen atom. And it's worth pausing and thinking about where that lone pair is sitting in an orbital sense. Is it involved in conjugation within this three-membered ring, or is it not? Is it sitting in a hybrid orbital? We should notice, for example, that this oxygen has three sigma bonds and no pi bonds in this resonance structure, and so it's possible for us to push electrons and draw a resonance structure in which that lone pair is engaged in a pi bond. And this suggests that that lone pair, and it suggests correctly, that that lone pair is involved in conjugation and is part of the pi system here. And so we're going to count that toward the pi electron count that we use in conjunction with Huckel's rule to evaluate whether this molecule is aromatic or anti-aromatic. And of course, the pi bond here, the carbon-carbon the pi bond, is also going to go into that count. So we can recognize here that we've got a cyclic structure. We have four pi electrons in the structure. It's necessarily planar, right? Three atoms in the ring. This makes this structure anti-aromatic. And the key thing here again to notice was that lone pair on oxygen is occupying a pi orbital, essentially, or is engaged in conjugation. There are various ways to say this, but basically that goes into the pi electron count. That lone pair goes into the pi electron count. This molecule on the right is thiophene, and the sulfur atom here has two lone pairs. And so we can immediately notice the molecule is cyclic. It is planar because it is fully conjugated, as we'll recognize in a second, and so it's either aromatic or anti-aromatic, and to determine which it is, we need to consider the pi electron count. Now, as usual, the carbon-carbon pi bonds are going to count for two apiece, but we've got this question of how to handle the lone pairs. And on sulfur and on oxygen, with two single bonds and two lone pairs, there's a question of whether both lone pairs count toward the pi electron count, just one, or neither. And for what we might call S2, two connected sulfur, or O2 oxygen, only one of the two lone pairs is engaged in conjugation. So we can draw resonance for forms and, and think about pushing electrons like this to show that one lone pair is engaged in pi bonding, is engaged in uh, electron delocalization, but we can't do the same with the other lone pair at the same time. You can imagine that this is going to create, for example, a problematic formal charge at this sulfur if we try to push both pairs of electrons. What this ends up meaning is that one of those lone pairs is occupying a p orbital and it is engaged in conjugation with the rest of the carbons in the ring, while the other is occupying a, a hybrid. And that lone pair that's sitting in a hybrid orbital is not involved in conjugation. It's sitting in an orbital that is in the plane of the ring as opposed to perpendicular to the plane of the ring. And so only one of those two pairs of electrons counts toward the pi electron count. This makes the total pi electron count six, 
six pi electrons, and that makes this molecule aromatic. So watch out when you're evaluating heteroatoms. I would encourage you to explicitly draw in those lone pairs and consider them carefully, uh, because lone pairs in some cases are engaged in conjugation and in other cases are not. The other problem I wanted to look at here was related to evaluating substituent effects on acidity, which is related to aromatic rings, since electron donating and withdrawing groups attached to aromatic rings are gonna change the acidity of attached acidic groups. And so in this problem, we've got four different phenols, an aromatic ring connected to an OH group, and the most acidic atom, or the most acidic hydrogen in each case is gonna be this hydrogen associated with the OH group. And what we wanna do is rank these from most acidic, let's put most acidic on the left, to least acidic. And conceptually, right, this means most acidic, that's the most inclined to give up H plus to form an anion. That's the most stable anion, the most stable conjugate base, or the least basic conjugate base is going to correspond to the most acidic conjugate acid, and vice versa, what I like to call the conjugate seesaw in action. Okay, one common thing that I, that I noticed is that a number of people just did this ranking based on the electronegativity of the atom directly connected to the benzene ring. And this is on the right track, but it kind of doesn't go far enough. So for example, we might notice, okay, oxygen, that's more electronegative than nitrogen, which is more electronegative than carbon. And using electronegativity logic, well, this oxygen is gonna pull electrons toward itself and make this OH group more acidic, making maybe A the most acidic, followed by D and B, and making C the least acidic. But this doesn't go far enough because it only considers electronegativity. It only considers inductive effects is one way to put it. We haven't talked about the resonance effects of the substituents, which are more important than the inductive effects. And so what we're going to focus on here, because it's, it's generally more important than inductive effects, is resonance. You should think about resonance first before inductive effects in general. And that's going to lead us to the right trend here, as we'll see. So how do we think about resonance here? Well, Drawing out lone pairs on those atoms directly connected to the rings where they exist is important because this is going to help us recognize, for instance, that the methoxy group and the dimethyl amino group here are electron donating groups. And actually, I'm going to push these electrons around all the way over to the pair position with respect to that substituent. This is going to put negative charge at that carbon that bears the hydroxyl group. So both of these, so the methoxy group is electron donating, what we would call an EDG, and the dimethyl amino group is an EDG. And before we think about those in re relation to each other, let's look at C and D. In C and D, we have the pattern for a resonance electron withdrawing group. We've got a pi bond between two atoms where the farther atom is more electronegative than the one directly connected to the ring. And so in both of these cases, we can push electrons up to the more electronegative oxygen atom. And this is going to result in kind of a, a siphoning off, if you will, of electron density from the aromatic ring. So we can push electrons like this. And you can imagine what we would end up with here is positive charge on this paracarbon, positive charge on the carbon connected to the hydroxyl group. What this shows is that these groups in C and D, these substituents, are electron withdrawing groups. Right? They're withdrawing electron density from the aromatic ring, and this resonance type electron flow shows this pretty clearly. And that's going to make these paracarbons relatively electron poor. And in the top case, again, just to contrast, we've got relatively rich carbons at the para position directly connected to the hydroxyl group. OK, so what are the effects on acidity? Well. Acidity corresponds to an accepting of electrons. And so where we have atoms that are relatively electron poor, those atoms kind of want to accept electrons to raise their electron density, right? And so C and D will be more acidic than A and B, thanks to the withdrawing effects of the electron withdrawing group. There's a deep connection here between electron withdrawing groups and acidity. And so without worrying too much about their relative order just yet, I'm just going to list C and D here on the most acidic side and A and B on the least acidic side. 
And thinking about these relative to each other, well, now we can think about ideas like the electronegativity of the substituent and inductive effects. So, for example, if we start with A and B, the two electron donating groups, we know that nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. Let's kind of note that. Less electronegative here for nitrogen, and the oxygen is more electronegative. This makes the oxygen a worse electron donor than the nitrogen, right? That oxygen kind of doesn't want to give up those electrons, certainly not as much as the nitrogen. And inductively, that oxygen exerts a withdrawing effect, since the bond dipole for the CO bond is pointed toward the oxygen. And so A is going to be a little more acidic than B, right? There's another way to think about this is there's more negative charge at this carbon in B than there is in A. A is a little, the ring in A is a little bit more electron deficient than the ring in B. So the most acidic compound here is going to be compound A followed by B. Now what about C and D? Well, a similar concept applies if we think about the electronegativity of this atom directly connected to the ring. We've got a positively charged nitrogen atom. Nitrogen is not only more electronegative than carbon, but the positive charge means we can think of that nitrogen as even more electronegative than sort of a plain vanilla nitrogen atom. This additional oxygen, for example, makes the nitrogen even more electronegative than, say, nitrogen in a standard looking amino group. And so the nitro group in D is one of the most electronegative withdrawing groups that we'll see in organic chemistry. And so you can think of really the, the group as a whole, in a way, um, as more electronegative than the carbonyl group, where we do still have a polarized pi bond, but it involves carbon. And so this is not quite as strongly withdrawing as the nitro group, although it is a very important withdrawing group. And so the most acidic here is going to be D, the nitro compound. And C will be a little bit less acidic than D because the withdrawing strength of the carbonyl group in C is not quite as strong as the withdrawing strength of the nitro group in D. So just to recap here, it was all about considering resonance effects and what groups are donating or withdrawing by resonance. Only after sort of grouping the substituents broadly into, okay, donating by resonance, withdrawing by resonance, kind of allowing us to divide the compounds in half, did we dig into electronegativity and think about how electronegativity causes differences in acidity for, for example, two what we might call electron-rich benzenes or phenols like this with, with donating groups, electronegativity is not quite as strong a f an effect as these resonance effects in most cases, and that should short of, sort of be your default mode for problems like this.